good afternoon and welcome to this important and incredible webinar. I am Reverend Carrie Jackson of RCRC, delighted to have each of you here with us today with an amazing group of speakers that we have lined up for this important webinar as we will be discussing the question, is the religious pro-choice community a sleeping giant? Welcome, glad to have you here with us today. Before I introduce our amazing panelists, I wanna tell you a little about the Religion and Repro Learning Center that RCRC launched last year. Well, I say last year, that is December of 2020. And in the midst of COVID, you probably don't even remember when December 2020 was but it was about uh, nine, 10 months ago. So we launched the webinar series last year, last December, we have continued it. This is our first for fall of 2021 and glad to have these amazing folks today. But we are also about to launch our online courses. Those will be courses that you'll get to register for and we will be launching those within the next four weeks. So stay tuned, watch out for those. I mean, we've got some exciting courses coming such as fetal life and personhood. And one of our panelists uh, for today is in that particular course. And just a lot of wonderful things. Learn about uh, Judaism, Islam, and their particular perspectives on reproduction. And, uh, and their interpretations of their own texts and how that does align or does not align with how Christian legislators use those texts. That, that's gonna be some good stuff. You're not gonna to wanna to miss that. So I wanna tell you about how we're gonna to operate today. We are so sorry we don't get to see all of you, but we wanna hear your voices through the chat. And we also wanna hear your voices through the questions. We will have a Q&A at the end of our time today, about 20 minutes for questions and answers with our panelists. And so we have a box on your screen that says Q&A. Please use that to write any questions that you may have. And we invite you, if you see a question that is exactly on point with something you wanna hear, uh, and talk about, please vote that. We're calling it upvoting it so we can get to as many of the most pertinent questions that you have. That's Q&A for your questions. Use the chat box to talk with the community of folks who are gathered here today. We, we really want you to be in, in conversation with one another. Lots of great conversations have happened during these webinars, um, good hookups and, and all of that kind of thing. So please use that dating. That's not dating hookup. Please, please know that. So that's it for my jokes. Um, my mother used to say to me that I was a preacher and a comedian. And so sometimes you will see that come out. But Let's launch right in. I am so delighted to introduce our panelists to you. Uh, first, you will hear from Ed Clarkson, who is on staff at Political Research Associates. But Fred is just an amazing journalist and researcher who has been writing about politics and religion for more than three decades. His publications, his writing has appeared in such publications as Mother Jones, at Ms. Magazine, Christian Science Monitor, Salon.com, on and on and on. And Fred wrote an article a year ago that is the source of to the, the title for today's webinar. And so we'll talk some more about that. Um, Fred is a brilliant thinker and investigator and brings so much to the conversation as he looks at issues of faith and politics in the US. We also have with us 
uh, Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg, who is scholar in residence at National Council of Jewish Women. She is an award-winning author. Um, Surprised by God is the title of one of her books. And she is in Newsweek magazine noted as one of the 10 rabbis to watch in this era. And she's one of the top 50 women rabbis in this country. Uh, wonderful accolades that she's been given. And as you meet her, you'll hear she is deserving of those. And also with us is Rever Reverend Dr. Rebecca Todd Peters, who is professor of religious studies and director of poverty and social justice program at Elon University. Uh, she is the author of Trust Women that came out a couple of years ago. Um, she is an ordained Presbyterian minister in uh, Presbyterian USA. Um, she's been active not only in her denomination, but also in the commission, the standing commission of the World Council of Churches. Um, she's received many awards, such as the Walter Wink Scholar Activist Award from Auburn Seminary, and her writings as well appear in numerous publications across the U.S. Just an amazing team we have today. And so we're going to dive right in with our questions. Are you ready, team? Yes, yes, yes. So Fred, I have this question for you. As I said, we have been so grateful that your work is the basis of the title for our session today. So what prompted you to write that, number one, based on all of your research? And what do you want to say to us updating, one, the themes of the article you wrote in September 2020, and, and how's that relevant today? And, and perhaps it's even more relevant uh, one year later since you wrote that article. So Fred. Uh, well, thank you for the kind introduction, Carrie. Uh, uh, good to be in such a good and distinguished company in such a, a difficult time. The, uh, what, uh, what brought about the article was uh, I'd been uh, tasked with an unusual project a while back and uh, that was to look over the horizon to a time when Roe v. Wade uh, will have been overturned. And the question I was tasked with was, could the pro-choice religious community help regain what will have been lost? Uh, so I spent an awful lot of time looking over the horizon just to sort of see what was possible. But the first thing I had to do was to create a list of pro-choice religious organizations. And the more I looked, the more I found. And the more I found the breadth and depth of the pro-choice religious community rooted in historic religious institutions in the US became evident. Um, second thing was to figure out what the pro-choice religious community might be able to do. Uh, and it helped to, uh, that reputable polling suggests that maybe a majority or near majority of all religious people in the US. So uh, I have a, a lot of thoughts about, about what, uh, what these things might be. And so I actually produced a report uh, about that for political research associates, along with a directory of pro-choice religious organizations. And uh, so I'm very pleased to be able to do that. Uh, so, uh, but the popularity of ideas through polling doesn't necessarily translate into political power to make things happen. Uh, but as a four decade student of the Christian right and how it got to become such a force in public life, I have some ideas about what it might take to get there. But here are the numbers. Uh, Americans are increasingly pro-choice. Uh, Pew study from 1995 to 2019 concluded that public support for legal abortion was as high as it had been in nearly a quarter century of polling. 61% said abortion should be legal in all or most cases. The numbers dipped a little bit uh, this year, but the long-term trend is upward. In 2021, Pew found that 55% of rank and file Catholics, the largest Christian denomination in the United States, uh, support access to abortion in all or most cases. They're joined by 64% of black Protestants, 63% of evangelical white Protestants, 83% of Jews, and 55% of Muslims. Pew data also reveal significant pro-choice minorities among uh, 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 Mormons and white evangelicals. 
But meanwhile, the Christian right has developed a sustained long-term approach to culture and political organizing that has resulted in electoral power far disproportionate to their numbers. And this is really interesting. The New York Times published a chart showing from, that from 2006 to 2018, the predominantly anti-abortion white evangelical Protestant share of the national vote increased from 23% to a steady 26%, even while its share of the population declined from 23% to 15%. Now, numbers like this do not happen by accident. And I can say from four decades, nearly four decades of following these things, that the reason they're able to sustain their disproportionate role in electoral life is mainly because they are organized to do so. The Christian right has, for example, developed the capacity to stage national political events that command not only the attention, but the personal presence of senior political leaders and government officials. So it might seem an unrealistic fantasy that suggests that a pro-choice religious community could create such a capacity, but the numbers suggest that it's not at all unrealistic. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama addressed national conventions of their respective denominations over the years. Why wouldn't future senior politicians appear before religious pro-choice political organizations? Still, we have to acknowledge there's nothing currently going on to create a pro-choice religious political movement of any consequence, but there could be. And there are lessons we can take from the evangelical movement and the Christian right. One of these is what they call parachurches. Now, these have historically been trans-denominational organizations with a stated religious mission that operate, and this is a key thing, outside of traditional institutions. They evangelize, recruit, and train people in theology, skills, and ecumenical organizing activities. In this way, these organizations paved the way for the kind of political parachurch operations that have emerged, matured, and gained remarkable political power in recent decades from the moral majority to the Christian coalition, through the current Family Research Council. Such pro-choice cultural and political organizations, should they ever be created, of course, should not ape the structure and methods of the Christian right. They'll need to be built in ways that are consistent with our own values. And this should be easy enough because the historic pro-choice religious institutions also bring a tradition of democratic governance and hold to the democratic values of religious pluralism, equality, and separation of church and state a constellation of values that comprise what we've called religious freedom. The pro-choice religious community thus stands against the ascendant Christian right in all of its dimensions that seek to erase these values. These things said, I'm not offering a panacea nor do I have a master plan, but I do have a menu of possibilities to consider, things that could be done and perhaps even underwritten by traditional philanthropies and incubated through existing nonprofit organizations or new ones established for the purpose. Some of these things could happen quickly, but most will take time in planning and development. First, people might create state or local or regional groups, at least as pilot projects, to begin to figure out what works and what doesn't. Electoral politics in a faith context would be new uh, in this way. Such groups might be more organized within specific traditions, such as Catholicism. They might be ecumenical. They might be multi-faith. They might also be multi-issue in the manner of what religious left organizations might be like if reproductive choice, access, and justice were a central rather than peripheral part of the agenda. Second type of organization um, might focus specifically on electoral development to create not only a voter base, but cadre and culture of skilled political workers, candidates, and office holders. This would be important because the knowledge and skill sets for electoral politics will be foundational for building power sufficient to regain what has been lost, while also holding to a vision of improving on what used to be. Now, these would also need to be permanent and their activities ongoing, continually renewed like democracy itself, and certainly not need to be reinvented each election cycle. It's important to underscore that the Christian right makes extraordinary efforts to find voters likely to be sympathetic to their cause, while the pro-choice religious community does not. Third kind of organization may be required to do the other two. We might think of them as clearing houses or strategy and training centers intended to create or point people to appropriate theological and political education resources, and perhaps to conduct ongoing organizer campaign and candidate schools. Christian Wright has a lot of them. 
Now, I want to emphasize that such schools on our side would need to also, perhaps surprisingly, teach the history and nature of the anti-abortion movement, as well as the broader Christian right, an ongoing evaluation of the evolution of strategy, tactics, and campaigns, and lessons learned. We have to learn from our experiences or risk repeating our mistakes. Much more in my report, but to conclude here, we have to acknowledge that this enormous sector of American society, the pro-choice religious community, is currently underorganized, underreported on, under-resourced, and under-organized. I hope that my studies will help to change this, but because when I finished my research, I was so surprised to find myself concluding that whatever happens at the Supreme Court, a pro-choice religious community could provide the moral, cultural, and political clout to eventually reverse the current anti-abortion political and policy trends. What we have is a virtually untapped source of hope and possibility for the future, and I would also argue for the present, of reproductive freedom, access, and justice, and solid evidence that a better future is possible. And I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Fred, we will hear more from you very shortly. But uh, Danya, I'm going to come to you. You have, at National Council of Jewish Women, spearheaded rabbis for choice. If you could talk with us about what that is and what your hope is that it is able to bring uh, among religious people who are pro-choice. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Rabbis for Repro is, um, I'll put the URL in the chat, is a network of now almost 1,500 Jewish clergy, rabbis and cantors and other Jewish clergy. Um, we have a proliferation of different titles, basically Jewish teachers of, who are ordained, um, who have pledged to preach and teach and organize and advocate for reproductive health, rights, and justice. And so that includes people who are part of our Rabbi Lobby Day, who showed up to meet with lawmakers and to convince them to uh, help sign on to become uh, co-sponsors to each and WIPA, which are two critical bills. Uh, WIPA, the Women's Health Protection Act, is basically the bill that will um, make it so that no matter what happens with the Supreme Court, no matter what happens with Roe versus Wade, uh, we will have abortion legal in the United States, and it is being voted on in the House now. And each the each act is a really important piece of legislation that will expand abortion access because rights aren't that helpful if people cannot access uh, abortion care. So um, we sent out a bunch of rabbis. We sent out 75 rabbis to meet with 50 plus lawmakers and got 29 new sponsors to each in WIPA. Um, last year, we had our inaugural Repro Shabbat uh, in which we asked the Jewish community to hold a special Shabbat uh, marking, you know, sort of a celebration of reproductive health rights and justice and to teach and preach about reproductive health rights and justice. And honestly, I will say, we weren't sure how it was going to go. Because even in the Jewish community, and I'll talk a little bit about abortion in Judaism in a moment, but even in the Jewish community where abortion is, there's like, there's no question about it being permitted. There is still such a social stigma because we live in America and the religious right, as, as Fred has noted, has done such a fantastic job of stigmatizing this basic healthcare. Um, but uh, you know there is there is sort of a hesitancy to try to talk about abortion clearly, and and I wasn't sure how this was going to go. We said maybe we'll try to get you know seventy five, a hundred communities to try to talk about it. We had three hundred and fifty. Well, you know, kind of just off the bat, boom. And so this year we're you know <laughs> expecting things will be bigger and bigger. The Jewish community is hungry to show up. Right, 750 synagogues. Each synagogue has, you know, thousands of, of members. And so the people are ready to go and ready to, to talk, to engage, to advocate. 
um, and to stand up. And um, I just today, and I'll have another tomorrow, um, I've been talking to rabbis in Texas who obviously have a lot to say and a lot to do um, now that abortion is functionally banned. And I'll, you know, a lot of work to do with congregants who have very real needs. Um, and this is a violation of our religious freedom because uh, abortion in Judaism is not only permitted, but sometimes required when the health of the pregnant person and for us, that is the physical health and also the mental health is jeopardized. So then it is a, according to Jewish law, it is a requirement. Um, and obviously the pregnant person is the person who gets to make the decision about what they do with their body. But if they go to their rabbi and they say, rabbi, what should I do? The rabbi will say, well, Jewish law would tell you to care for yourself first because your health comes first. That's a no-brainer in Judaism. Your health comes first. And Texas, you know, people say, like, well, you know, Texas has a provision. Texas is like, yeah, if you're going to bleed out and die in the emergency room, then maybe we will allow you to terminate your pregnancy. But that's not the same as caring for your health, right? That does not, there's not a question about, you know, will you be worse for wear after the pregnancy? Right. For them, it's it's life or death. ER dramatic scenario is the only provision. And Judaism takes a much bigger view of what health and safety involves. Um, and this is the thing in Judaism, um, the fetus is not does not have the status of personhood. Right. So the first in the Talmud, it says, that, you know, for the first 40 days, it is uh, mere fluid. Maya Alma, which um, based on you know sort of the Talmudic reckoning versus um, you know American last menstrual period reckoning, it would be about the seventh or eighth week of, week of pregnancy, by how we count. Just sixty six percent of abortions are performed up until that time, mere fluid, and then for the rest of pregnancy, from then until birth, uh, the fetus is considered part of the pregnant person's body. Um, the fetus is considered as its mother's, let's use gendered language, but as the pregnant person's thigh, right? It is a body part. And only at birth then is the pregnant person, is, is the fetus, like once the fetus's head, baby's head is out in the world, then we say, oh, look, you're breathing. Welcome to the world. Now, if we have to choose between, you know, if both lives are in danger, then we have to start to have some conversations about whose lives to save. But up until there is a head out of the birth canal, you know, as you know, that's sort of an ancient language, um, what they would do with a C-section, you know, people have written stuff on that. But um, functionally, until midway through the birthing process, whose life you save is the pregnant person because they're the person. And then only only after that does it get more complicated. So. Danya, thank yeah. you. It is really important that people hear how Jewish texts understand that and how Jews understand texts that Christians often use and completely bend some other way. And, and we need to talk about that reality. Um, as Fred was talking about para-church, I think that is so important um, to cut across denominations within Christianity. But understanding that 60 to 70% of individuals in the US regard themselves as Christian and about 2% of individuals in the US regard themselves as Jews. So here there is this incredible teaching that Judaism offers that has been, if people don't mind my use of this word, but has been co-opted and misrepresented then and that's the teaching that the 60 to 70% of people who identify as Christians get. Uh, we have the Q&A. We really want your questions. Right now, we only have one so far. But 
please put those in. Um, it'll be important for the conversation with Fred and Rabbi Danya and, and Dr. Peters. And so Dr. Peters, I turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Carrie. It's so good to be here and be part of this conversation, which is just an amazing conversation. Um, so thank you for hosting this. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, work that uh, came out of my last um, research project, which, which culminated in this book, Trust Women, A Progressive Christian Argument for Reproductive Justice. And it's really nice to follow Rabbi Dania because um, there are a lot of Christians who share a lot of the beliefs that, that you just shared, um, and there's not a monolithic understanding of abortion within Christianity, despite the fact that there's a dominant narrative in this country um, that Christianity is against abortion. And so I call that the justification framework. Um, it's the framework that uh, really shapes how we think and talk about this um, issue in our culture. Uh, and. And, you know, and I argue it's really rooted in a very narrow traditionalist Christian patriarchal interpretation of family and, um, you know, teleology, what, what, are, what are we called to do and be um, as men and women, um, as people. Um, and there's some beliefs here that undergird this justification framework. One is that all pregnancies are gifts from God. Another is that prenates um, are full human beings at the moment of conception. Um, and another one is that women are morally obligated to gestate when they are pregnant. Um, and so these are assumptions that underlie this argument that, that women have to offer some sort of acceptable justification if they want to end a pregnancy. Um, and you know, we, we really see that, that particularly these two ideas about uh, sort of women's purpose and uh, fetal personhood um, have combined to create the idea that abortion is wrong. Um, and that idea that abortion is morally wrong, um, I argue, I think is a minority Christian belief. I don't think it is the dominant Christian belief. Um, and I think that uh, it is what dominates our conversation largely because the religious right, um, evangelical Christians and Catholics um, are the ones who have the most airspace. They are, as Fred has pointed out, are the most organized and they have been pushing this narrative for 30 plus years now. Um, and it is dominating the conversation. So within this paradigm, a fertilized egg is the same as a baby. Um, and if that is your starting point, um, then everything that's happening now makes sense. This has been the, the goal from the beginning of that movement is to overturn Roe v. Wade, to argue that abortion is murder. Um, and there are uh, many, many, many Christians who reject that idea. Um, and so I, I just want to briefly review ways in which this framework is flawed. Um, it distorts conversation and impedes dialogue. It harms women and pregnant people. And it's really focused on the wrong moral question. And if we haven't identified the right moral question, then everything we do is not actually helping to address the problem that, that we're facing. Um, so it distorts the conversation by creating false binaries, um, you know, pro-choice, pro-life. Um, most uh, Americans, a, a public religion research institute um, study showed most Americans actually, most religious Americans actually identify as both pro-choice and pro-life. Um, but the justification framework pushes the pro-choice folks to, to, to find ways to justify women's right to abortion and pushes people on the pro-life side to try to eliminate those acceptable justifications. So those acceptable justifications are what I talk about as categorizing abortions. We've categorized abortions into these two different frames, right? So we have prim abortions or prenatal health, rape, incest, mother's life. These are widely supported um, by uh, uh, public opinion um, that, that, it, that these are the acceptable, the justifiable abortions. Um, but, you know, creating this, uh, this idea that some are acceptable and some aren't really is a moral sword that, that, that divides people who have abortions into two categories, the tragic and the damned. And we know that only 25% of uh, abortions occur in prim abortions. And the majority of abortions in this country are the, I don't wanna have a baby or another baby um, abortions, what uh, Katie Watson, legal scholar Katie Watson calls ordinary abortions. 
Um, and so uh, finally, the wrong moral question is, uh, is abortion right or wrong? That's not the question women ask. Um, people who are pregnant say, what should I do when faced with an unplanned, unwanted, or medically compromised pregnancy? And there are a lot of resources that we should be mobilizing in our communities to help people answer that question, because it's a significant moral question. Um, and people need support when they are answering that question. So I want to talk about, um, Carrie asked me to talk about not only what is the justification framework and how it's harmful, but she also asked me to talk about the ways in which progressive people of faith can interrupt. Uh, well, first, how we perpetuate this justification and then how we can interrupt that. And so one of the ways uh, I want to, to highlight a couple of ways that we perpetuate this one is a lot of mainline and progressive Christians just simply refuse to talk about the issue. Um, I think it's it's there's a sort of this allergic uh, sense of, of talking about abortion in um, progressive faith communities. Um, I think, you know, I don't know, lots of reasons that could be fear of alienation or, or, or judgment or being judged, um, fear of offense. I think there are a lot of sort of classic liberal responses um, uh, or, or, or uh, classic pitfalls of liberalism we could talk about that relate to this, but it's something we have to overcome and we have to really move forward and um, talk much more openly. And I was so excited by hearing about what rabbis for choice are doing. And I think they're really showing us a model for what needs to be done in progressive faith communities across the country. Um, you know, and I think, you know, we're all aware of how loud and dominant the pro-life um, uh, religious communities are, um, and they say unapologetically unapolog that they are pro-life um, and stand up for that. Um, I also think that some of this reticence in the mainline and pro uh, progressive uh, Christian, particularly communities, um, is largely a result of outdated theology, outdated theology um, and the effectiveness of the Christian right in dominating the discourse. And so if we're going to interrupt, there are many things we need to do. We need to change the conversation. The first thing we need to do is stop letting the religious right define the debate. We need to update our theology and we need to say unapologetically that abortion access is a non-negotiable social justice issue. So I just wanna move through these um, quickly because I know we wanna get on to questions, but as we think about updating our theology, we, we did this with um, very bad theological interpretations and beliefs uh, about uh, homosexuality and the Bible and, and Christian traditions around LGBT um, uh, people and issues. And um, we have not yet done that with our thinking about abortion. And, and doing so um, will help um, create much more nuanced conversations. Um, and so there, there are a couple of, of things I want to throw out there that can be part of that updating our theology um, and developing new theological frameworks for thinking of and talking about um, abortion, um, uh, pregnancy and abortion. Uh, and the first is parenting as a sacred trust and a covenant responsibility um, and really focusing in on the importance of parenting and why we need to make sure that people are actually making decisions to be parents um, uh, because they want to have children, not simply because they're pregnant. Um, we can also highlight uh, the creation narrative, Genesis 1, God created us, God created us and called us good, we have moral agency, we need to respect the bodily integrity of women um, and people who are pregnant, um, and we can reclaim this idea of sanctity of life and the sanctity of life of women and pregnant people. Um, uh, I think another, another theme that I like to talk about is abundant life um, in the New Testament. In John, Jesus talks about uh, coming to bring uh, so that we might have abundant life. Um, and I think that uh, the idea of moving toward um, uh, visions of abundant life in our community can, can help provide a, a really helpful um, theological frame for thinking about these questions. Um, you know, and if, if you want to go, you know, m even more deeply sort of scriptural, we can go into the Exodus text um, that's often cited here about the two men who are fighting and strike a pregnant woman. Um, and what we see there is a very clear difference of value that it's possible to value um, 
uh, prenatal life or the potential for life that is represented in a pregnancy without valuing it in the same way that we value the pregnant woman's life. Um, and that it's important to be able to draw those distinctions and to say um, that we can value something but not value it equally with the, the pregnant woman or the pregnant person. Um, and so again, just as Rabbi Dania has, has, has pointed out, religious freedom is one of the most fundamental um, arguments we need to be making here. Um, uh, here's another uh, poll from PRI that shows uh, that very, very few people in this country want to make abortion access illegal. Um, you know, second, uh, second way we need to, to really be um, thinking about this and disrupting is really highlighting that forced pregnancy is a human rights violation. Um, it's a sin against human dignity and respect for women's lives. Um, and finally, sorry, Oh, I must have deleted my last slide, that's fine. Um, I wanted to end again with Abundant Life. Um, I, I, one of the first groups that I met with after the book came out was a local church um, in Elon and I, the social justice committee wanted me to come talk about it. And, and we talked and they were like, wow, this is amazing. And they said, we had never thought about this issue as a social justice issue. And I think that's true. I think there are social justice committees all across this country in uh, congregations that haven't really thought about the ways in which this issue is a social justice issue. And I think that um, that's an important piece uh, that we really need to elevate and help people find language and um, uh, uh, theological frames for, for thinking about it in new ways. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peters. So we have a few questions in, we have space and time for some more questions, please do go look at the questions that are there and upvote them if you would be interested in making sure uh, one of those questions is heard. Before we hop to those questions, I have a question um, I want to pose to all three of, of you. And that is, um, Dr. Elizabeth Fries at Auburn Seminary and Drew University, um, says there's a morality gap. And I love those words. Uh, as, as you were talking, uh, Tati or Dr. Peters, as I'll call you here, um, there are many people who, who do understand this as a justice issue. And yet emotionally, they struggle with, is it okay? Because that narrative abortion is murder has really captivated the thinking of a lot of people. And so I ask all three of you, what do you recommend we do to help people take more and embrace more of, of what Judaism understands as the fetus, as a part of the pregnant person's body and not an independent, because we have in our society the emotionality of the anticipation of a new life coming. That, that's a really powerful emotional reality that grabs almost everyone. And such that when a pregnant person is, is killed and if the fetus dies, and this is not from Hebrew scripture, but in US culture, we have feticide laws in most states because of the emotionality of, they took what we were looking forward to. Somebody's gotta pay, right? That, that's so much of, of what people think. And so I'm curious if any of you have any recommendations about how to address that Here's the intellectual understanding of justice, or here even is the faith um, commitment to justice. But then here's all this emotionality about that which is anticipated and therefore somebody's gotta pay. The emotional aspect of that, I think might be part of what legislators are riding on, even though at the end of the day, that's really not what their objective is but they get to use it in, in some way. So do any of you have anything that might help us regarding that? 
Well, I'll, I'll be happy to start off. I mean, I think there's lots of things we can do. I think, I think you're right. I think the, the way that you've described that is very helpful. Um, and I think it really goes back to that reality that the religious right has created ideas and feelings in this country that do not necessarily track with how people's theologies are around other issues or, or and in the absence of an alternate narrative, a counter narrative, a counter theological narrative, that fills the space. So we really need to have religious leaders, faith leaders um, up speaking and teaching publicly about this, about alternative theological counter narratives. Um, some of the ones that I just shared, and there, I'm sure there are many, many more we can develop. And, you know, fundamentally, this is going back to this issue of fetal personhood. And that is not something um, that is a belief that has been created by uh, a minority religious group and really just propagated that, um, you know, we have to stop calling it a baby. I mean, the, the language that we use is very emotional language. It's one of the reasons that I coined the term prenate to talk about life inside the, the woman's body because um, most people, I love that you're using fetus. Most people don't use the word fetus. If you're talking to people in your local congregation, if you're talking to people who are pregnant, they don't talk about their fetus. They talk about the baby and just the ongoing use of that word continues that emotive feeling. So disrupting that anticipatory proleptic idea that what we think is going to, what might be a baby is a baby. It's not. We have to interrupt. We have to um, shift that um, just on a daily basis. Thank you. Fred or, or Danya, do either of you want to respond to, to that as well? Yeah, before? I mean, I think just continuing to teach that, I mean, this is, this is what, what uh, hegemony does, right? It teaches you that a dominant view is the only one and it becomes a white noise and you don't you don't, you don't have the capacity to see that there is any other way of, of doing it. And so as I have started to teach publicly, even like on Twitter, right, you know, about what Judaism says about abortion, I watch, you know, people's minds go in slow motion because it hadn't occurred to them that there was any other theological position to take. And then it's like, okay, and now let's talk about Islam, which also does, you know, abortion is permitted in Islam. Like, like, you know, there are other ways of approaching theology than this one fairly recent evangelical approach, right? And even the Catholic idea of, uh, you know, Catholicism only outlawed abortion from conception. You know, it's been a couple hundred years. It's not more recent than that. I, you know, it's, it was from quickening from um, fetal movement for a very long time, but not, not from conception. And we'll, you know, the more that we're able to do theological education to help people to understand that, that there's been something put in their orange juice, basically, that it's not normative, right? That it's not the only way, that there are other ways of being. And then you, help them to sort of see what they've been seeing, at which point you're able to say, so these abortion bans are taking a very specific and not the only Christian, but a specific Christian definition of life and trying to make it the law of the land. Do we or do we not have separation of church and state in this country, right? And it becomes, it, you know, you're able to sort of, it, it, it winds up having to tease out a lot of things for people and there is a lot of emotionality you know and i say this as 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 a as a person who has been pregnant as a person with three kids a person who's miscarried like you know i have feelings about the stuff i've carried in my uterus as well right and we have to do we have to start with education and that helps to just detangle some of the ways in which what we think of as normative and what we think of as normal. And, and that, that helps to just, you know, little by little unhook some of the things that are hooked up so tight right now. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Fred, I want to direct this question to you. Oh, can I just respond to the other one briefly? Oh, yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, um, a little different perspective. Uh, I very much appreciate what Dr. Peters and Rabbi Rittenberg are saying about connecting religious and theological values to how we articulate those values and, uh, and what goes on in our culture. Uh, I also look at it in reverse because polling shows that large numbers, one polling I was looking at, you know, showed 77% of people support Roe v. Wade. Well, if that's true, how then do people reconcile, you know, their personal views and, and the kind of muddy kind of problems that the, that the others have spoken of? Uh, and, and I think that that's important too, because it's not just personal, it's also profoundly political. If people are going to be able to address uh, matters of, uh, of uh, supporting Roe, they have to be comfortable in knowing why they do. And I think that that's, that's a useful process too. I, I really appreciate that last piece that you said for people to be comfortable in knowing why they do. And so much in our culture has lulled people to move in ways without really critiquing the why. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that as, as a critical piece. So there's a question from Rebecca uh, about the orientation of pro-choice as siding with the devil. Um, and, and we know it is not only a QAnon um, orientation that people who are quote unquote liberals are um, with the devil and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How does your vision of a parachurch movement help break through that narrative that is is pervasive in certain aspects of, of US culture right now about liberal yeah. or progressive or really justice seeking is in some way um, siding with the devil. How, how, how do you recommend we break through that? Well, a couple of questions in there, I think, but, uh, but one thing in terms of create a parachurch, you know, political entity, and that is that we've already, you know, we're trying to address the kind of question of how do we reconcile our values, you know, with public policy and politics mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the future of, of legislation and judiciary. Uh, so as we go through that process, we, we get better at it. It's not only figuring things out in a, in, a, in a religious community, it's figuring out how we relate our values to the larger culture of religious pluralism, which includes the people who disagree with us, right? We have to accept in some fundamental way, pardon the term, the, uh, that there are people who are just always going to disagree on these things. And our task then is to figure out, well, how do we tolerate the formidable and uh, insistent opposition at the same time as we advance uh, these ideas mm -hmm. in a culture, a, a religious ideas about abortion, right? In a, in a, in a culture of religious pluralism. And uh, that's how we begin to do it. Uh, and sort of in a, in a different task, and I've said in other contexts, and that is that, uh, you know, as we engage, we, need, we have the need to de-demonize ourselves, right? If we don't think of ourselves as allied with Satan and not, you know, then how do we persuade our friends and neighbors and people in other religious communities that, well, whatever you may be thinking and saying, we're not those people. And but mm -hmm. we need to be very conscious of the fact that we are viewed that way. And it's gonna take some, uh, uh, some relationship building in order to, uh, uh, to neutralize that. Thank you. So I, I just, this is, uh, go ahead. Can I jump in? I just yes. wanted to say that I also think it's important to think about how much um, the sort of what time and energy and resources you have and how you're going to spend that. I mean, I think that um, fighting QAnon and fighting people who are out at the clinic is, is probably not the place you're going to change hearts and minds. Although I think there are lots and lots of people in our congregations who are um, ambivalent about these issues. And those are the people that I would recommend spending um, time and energy talking with, teaching with, um, walking with. Um, because I think, again, that uh, we need to, um, you know, do the work where we can um, uh, find the places where social change can happen. 
So Dr. Peters, you mentioned um, the fight for uh, LGBTQ rights uh, earlier. Um, so Elizabeth asked the question about uh, the United Methodist Church that we know is, is uh, in its own conflict right now as it relates to uh, reproductive freedom, as it relates to LGBTQ dignity, women's rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is there any way within denominations and in congregations where those kind of fractures are there to help with the education? And what are some of the main points that need to be brought forward that is not um, only justice in a uh, theoretical sense, but it is really grabbing people's hearts and, and minds? And I, I asked this to, to all three of you as well. That's from Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I, I will jump in here just to say, you know, the way that the, the new framing moving away from, from justification that, that I offer in the book and that I find very helpful is reproductive justice. And that is a term and a movement that was organized um, by women of color, by 12 black women in um, 19, um, 92 uh, as they developed a new movement that has a much broader spectrum for thinking and talking and understanding issues related to you know um, uh, uh, the freedom to have children, the freedom to not have children, um, and the ability to raise children in safe and healthy environments. And when we reframe our goal around something that's much more positive like that, it includes abortion, it includes abortion rights, but it also says, look, I think a lot of our time and space is being sucked up and, 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 and resources in fighting over abortion. And that is money and time and space that is not going to help families and to help people who um, have a broader set of issues. Um, and I think that if we can get our congregations talking about that, um, and, and this is an, an, another piece that I want to really highlight here because it, it builds on, on Fred's work and the, the work that he's been doing around parachurch organizations um, uh, and, and also dovetails on the LGBT work that has been done in progressive communities. And that is there's a group of people who are organizing a new parachurch organization. Um, it's called SACRED, it stands for Spiritual Alliance of Communities for Reproductive Dignity. There's going to be a convening in January, and we're inviting congregations and individuals just to show up. But the idea would be that we mobilize people, we're writing curriculum, they take this curriculum into their congregations, and the curriculum isn't just about abortion, it's about reproductive justice, it's about the roots of white supremacy in shaping and um, framing patriarchy and traditionalist Christianity in this country. And it's that kind of education in congregations across the country that is parallel to what happened with LGBT transformations in um, uh, religious spaces and religious communities. Um, and it's digging into and rethinking um, those ideas, uh, and for some people thinking for the first time, um, and not simply receiving ideas, um, that I think it has the, the most positive capacity for long-term social change, really building out what, um, what Fred was talking about in terms of uh, trying to think about new strategies that can really um, have a possibility for um, engaging uh, and, and producing long-term social change. But I also wanna highlight, especially if there are media people here, um, these are voices that are being ignored in the media and they're, um, it is work and research that is not being funded. Um, and so the to move this forward, there needs to be much more um, space in the public conversation. We need to make that space because nobody's gonna give it to us. Um, and we need to really keep um, uh, pushing on the under-resourced aspect of this and push funders to um, recognize that faith is a really important aspect of this conversation um, and that work that's being done around these issues in faith spaces needs to be funded. Thank you. I have one last question because it's almost time for us to wrap up. And, and thank you all for your incredible questions, Phyllis and Barb and Judy and Bailey and Anonymous and, and on and on and on. 
um, incredible questions you're asking and, and we will keep these questions so we're able to respond to them in some other ways. But one question is, because of the law in Texas, SB8, now there is this outpouring across the country of individuals bringing money and asking the questions, what can we do, et cetera, et cetera. How do we keep people of faith mobilized in a longer term way? So it's not just the issue du jour that it feels like for, for some people that while many people are part of that sleeping giant that, that Fred writes about, how do we keep the, that giant more awake as it is right now? Fred, can you respond to that or, or Daniel? Um, sure, and uh, perhaps in one little surprising aspect, perhaps. And that is that, uh, as I said in, in my presentation, the, the pro-choice religious institutions, right, are the bastions of the, what we're talking about. They are also democratic institutions. And these are places where people can decide for themselves who their leaders are and develop their, theo their own theologies as, uh, as Dr. Peters is talking about. We're in a transformative moment. But what I wanna warn about, because remember my expertise is in the area of the Christian right. And that is that there are forces who don't want these things to happen and is systematically degraded and diminished, particularly the mainline Protestant denominations over the past 40 years in order to demolish their capacity to affect uh, culture and public policy in the way that they historically did before. As, as they became more progressive, the right began to uh, attack and seek to use bad faith arguments and bad faith proxies to get into the democratic process in order to destroy it. So as these good initiatives go forward, be ready. Be wary. Thank you. I would just, I would just add that, uh, you know, I think um, people got complacent, started to feel like this was one of those rights that they could just take for granted. Um, I want to say white people in particular, um, you know, at least speaking for, you know, the, the Jewish community is, is largely white. And so I'm gonna speak for my corner of the, the world that people of privilege, people with privilege can always access abortion care. And the people who are, um, are hurt most by bans are always uh, people, uh, communities of color um, and people with um, less resources um, of all kinds. And, um, and I think this, this last round has been a real wake up call for a lot of people. And we need to be building infrastructure for the long term. And that means not just um, running from state to state, depending on you know where the action is, but thinking about a sort of larger national strategy, long term national strategy, thinking past next year and the year after and um, thinking about culture change and community change and how this work becomes part of a practice and doesn't just become running and the adrenaline and the stress when there's the action, but how, how this becomes what we do and part of our work. And it just becomes integrated into our lives because this work, this fight is not going to go away anytime soon. And so we need to be setting ourselves up for the long haul. And it may not just be a marathon, it may have to be a relay race. And we need, might need to figure out what the infrastructure is for that. Thank you for that. And so sisters and brothers, we've come to the close of our, our time, but justice is a relay race. It is the work for every generation. And I'm excited that RCRC is relaunching a program that we ran um, many years ago that was called Spiritual Youth for Reproductive Freedom. Um, it is getting underway at a few college campuses. Wellesley in Massachusetts is one, Oberlin in Ohio is another, and we're in conversation with some other schools. If any of you out there is a student and you want to activate a SURF, that's the 
acronym, uh, the nickname for it, Spiritual Youth for Reproductive Freedom. Um, please be in contact with us. We would love to involve you in that. Um, it's a parachurch kind of thing, if, if, as Fred, um, you might see it in that way or not, but we want to make sure, in addition to things like sacred that we're doing with congregations, that we will get underway with congregations in 2020, 2022, SURF is for our ability to reach young people who may not be involved in a religious community per se, but they understand themselves as spiritual and they want to be involved in this work. Please let us know any ways that you would like to be involved with us. Um, I think I saw uh, Dr. Peters put in the chat, if you're interested in learning more about sacred, that, uh, that again is for congregational work um, with a particular focus on Christian communities, but not exclusively there. If you wanna know more about that, please be in touch with us. If you wanna know more about uh, spiritual youth for reproductive freedom, be in touch. And if you wanna know more about rabbis for choice, please be in touch with us and, and we'll connect you with uh, Rabbi Danya, and she just put the uh, connection in the in the chat. Um, we've got to keep doing this work. It has been handed to our generation now. And as long as we have patriarchy, as long as we have racism, sexism, classism, all of those things, we need to keep doing this work. And um, Thank you so very much for being here with us today. Our next um, session is coming up on October 7th and we will, Mel, what are we doing on October 7th? I can't remember. And then on October 13th, we have another session where we will look at Christian dominionism. That was a session uh, we had planned for a couple of weeks ago and our speaker uh, was not feeling well, we we're rescheduling that. And then later this fall, we will be talking about the issues of abortion in countries around the world, the US and other countries. And um, please be a part of these important conversations. Frederick Clarkson, Clarkson, wonderful human being that you are and just intentional thinker that you are. I really appreciate you for prodding this and asking, is, is this a sleeping giant? And, and let us continue to talk about ways to wake that sleeping giant up. Um, Dr. Toddy Peters, thank you. Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg, thank you all for your incredible work. And we look forward to seeing this amazing uh, audience. And again, we're waving to you, even though we can't see you, we really appreciate you and blessings to each one of you. Until next time.